Welcome to Dare to Leap, a conversation and community supporting women just like you to gain the freedom, flexibility, and financial security you desire and deserve with CEO and founder of Virtual Expert Training, Kathy Guggenauer. This is Dare to Leap, and now here's the powerhouse tiara-wearing Kathy Guggenauer. Super excited to be here today with my guest, Lisa Baker. She is an integrative nutrition health coach and nonprofit consultant. She has a lot of titles, so I'm going to tell you some more of them. She is a self-published author, a blogger, a podcaster, and woefully, I love that word, underpaid COO of a busy family of four spread across the globe. Lisa brings her passion, knowledge, and experience to the table to help you reach your health goals. I can't wait to talk to her today because I have a lot of health goals. Her sweet spot as a coach is supporting overworked, overscheduled, overtired, and over it all women in the mission-driven nonprofit sector. Now, I'm not in the nonprofit sector, but I'm definitely mission-driven, so we'll be talking more about that. For sure. <laughs> more, yeah, more simply, Lisa's mission is to support you in being well while doing good. She's currently looking at the pandemic as one possibility to grow healthier humans, organizations, and communities. I love that. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Woo! <laughs> so if you are not watching this on YouTube, just know we are two women rocking our gray hair and lisa has an amazing haircut and i will be probably <laughs> go to youtube one just for that <laughs> <laughs> i'm telling you she looks awesome if you're like oh sure she's an integrative nutrition health coach i'll bet she looks healthy yeah she does <laughs> <laughs> my goal is to so, like walk in a room and have women say I'll have what she's having <laughs> oh I love that didn't I basically do that oh my gosh I love your hair yes. <laughs> I, 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 that's a, I'll have what you're having mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah so Lisa tell us a little bit about you and how you became um this how, how you became mission driven all about nonprofit um and health all right. Yeah, it's it's a long and gory story. I'm one of those people that you look at my resume and you're like, this woman is completely unemployable. Or you could look at it and say, this woman could do anything. So of course I look at it that way. <laughs> and I, I look at that you could do anything. Yeah, Absolutely. I kind of blend it all together. I started out teaching Chinese of all things. And I find that even in my health coaching, I I rely heavily on my foreign language instruction skills because I really look at it as teaching, teaching women another language around health. And so we do a lot of mind shift mindset kind of work that involves rewiring your brain by the language that you use. So the first example would be something like, there are two ways to ask the same question, like, ah, why did I do this? And huh, why did I do this? right? Same sentence, two completely different meanings. One shuts down the conversation. The other one's like, this is an opening. I can actually figure out why I ate that second piece of chocolate cake again, even though I knew that I didn't want to do that, right? So it's really using language to rewire our brains just by our words, because our words become reality. And so that was my first career teaching foreign language. And then I went into food and uh, became a caterer and private chef and uh, really fell in love with food big time uh, at that point. And then we had kids and kids and catering clients need you the same time, nights, weekends and holidays. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. goodbye catering business. And I went into office work and I happened to drop into office work mostly in the nonprofit sector. So I worked in a church. I worked at a university. Um, And then most recently at a, at a 501c3 nonprofit. And so this whole time I was just collecting all these skills and uh, eventually just fell in love with nutrition on a different level thinking I was teaching uh, cooking classes on the side while I was, while I was working at the nonprofit. And it really was not cooking as entertainment, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. But a lot of times we go to a cooking class, it's like, let's go, we're going to have wine with the girlfriends. We're going to make Thai food. And then you never make it again. Right. (laughs) So, yeah, and that's exactly. fine because that's entertainment. Been there, and they're done that many times. Yes. And it's, and serves if they a tell purpose. me that I'm actually going to cook, I'm like, 
I have to cook. I <laughs> Wait, I thought I was going to drink wine. <laughs> yeah, I thought I was going to watch you cook. <laughs> exactly. And there's nothing wrong with that form of, of cooking as entertainment. What I was trying to do was really help women uh, figure out how to cook from scratch on a regular basis because it's it's a lost skill. It's and I think in some ways, in some weird ways, the pandemic has made us realize like what a lost art that is. Uh, I have a Absolutely. lot of people complaining about cooking at home on a regular basis. And I'm like, are you kidding? It's my spiritual practice. Like, ah! <laughs> a lot of people don't think that. <laughs> but um, so I was teaching cooking classes and then I realized like, yes, I can help them quote unquote, fix their food. And there are so many other things that play into what nourishes us and what doesn't. So in the style of health coaching I practice, which is called integrative nutrition, we talk about the food that you put in your mouth as being secondary, because if you think about, you know, if you hate your job, your boss is an ogre, your coworkers are just idiots, you're the one who's going to come home and empty that pint of ice cream standing with the freezer door open, right? But yeah, I know we're all raising our hands. Yep. Been there, done that. <laughs> but if you love your job and your boss is a gem and your coworkers are your best friend, you're very unlikely to have that affect your relationship with food. So we call that primary foods, things like career, relationships, uh, spiritual practice, time in nature, sleep, all these other things that nourish us or don't. So in my style of health coaching, we really talk about, okay, yes, let's talk about the food you're putting in your mouth, but let's talk about why you're putting it in there too. Because very often it's the relationship with the food that's the issue rather than the food itself. So that's how I came to do what I do. And uh, I realized probably about two years ago that my most successful and most fun clients are what I call mission-driven women. And that's a lot of people think, oh, that means nonprofit work. But for me, it's really anybody from a stay-at-home mom who, when you think about it, like this is the most mission-driven work there is, right? Raising children to be good citizens of the world <laughs> and you know, to do better by the planet than we've done so far and to be, be nicer to each other than we've done so far. Like if that's not mission-driven, I don't know what is. <laughs> but I also include under there, think about everybody who's on the front lines right now, child care, health care, elder care, hospice care, social work, educators, non-profiteers, volunteers, all of these people who, who do what they do because they love it. And because as women, we're drawn to these professions, we also tend to burn out because we spend our days taking care of everybody else. And we come home and guess what? There's a whole room full of people, a whole house full of people who also want to be taken care of. And so we fall into this sort of chronic caregiving and there's no escape from that if you're, if you're not being mindful. Like we've, we've backburnered our own health so long that it's like not even on the stove anymore, right? Oh, I love that analogy. We've backburnered it so long it's not even <laughs> yeah. on the stove anymore. Yeah, it's I, gone. <laughs> I, I, I'm very guilty of that. And, we all and are. I, I just have so many things I wanna unpack. I've just, I literally muted myself so I could type some notes. First, I just want to say um, that I 100% love that you are working with women, mission-driven work. Um, while my business is not a nonprofit, that is absolutely where I am with it. Um, I am so focused on helping women become um, you're helping them get healthier so that their yeah. wealth increases. I want to help them get wealthier in other ways too, yes. like actual money, because while a lot of us are like, um, and I know nonprofit doesn't mean they don't make any money. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. A lot of people have that misunderstanding. <laughs> <Big> myth. <laughs> nonprofit means they don't make any money. They actually make money. They just um, invest it in different ways. They have to and, spend it a certain way. Yeah. Yeah. For profit ones too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, I really want to help women become wealthy, actually financially wealthy, healthy, um, wealthy, mindset wealthy, all of those things, because yeah. I truly believe, Lisa, and I'm guessing you will too, that we can change the world. Yes. Once women have more power and can make more impact as a result of that, we can yeah. change the world. We can yes. have more love, more generosity. We can take care of the planet. We can do all of those things that isn't happening right now. Yes. Yeah. We've been, we've been living under this very masculine model and, you know, nothing wrong with men, nothing wrong with masculine energy. And it's not really serving us very well right now. So I was always joking, like as much as I love Gail Williamson, it's like, the world is not ready for her to be president. But what I loved about her is that her energy is 100% feminine. She is about tend and mend. 
And I see a lot of other women in politics who are like, they're playing by the boys' rules in the boys' sandbox. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Let's change the rules. Let's move to a different sandbox. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, men are, I, and, and I'm with you. I mean, I'm married. I love my husband. I have two sons and five grandsons. So if <gasps> I hated men, I'd be in well, trouble. You, I hope you're treated like a queen. I hope that's why you wear a tiara because you must be the queen bee. <laughs> <laughs> they do treat me. I will tell you that they do treat me very yeah. well. Uh, yeah, that's incredible. Um, you are uh, out uh, testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but see, in my work, it's like 99% women, um, because, you know, I teach people how to be virtual assistants. And that's a support role. So women are attracted to that and men aren't. Yeah, very yes. like out of 300 people I've trained, I've trained five men. Yeah, that's incredible. And that just speaks to what attracts us. It's that tend, mend, support, nurture, help, assist. Mm -hmm. And there's Mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that unless it's being taken advantage of. And and very, very often it is. Yeah. Yeah. But I have had men um, who wanted to coach me and they would say, um, you got to lose the tiara or you're never going to make any money. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not losing the tiara. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> not losing the tiara and I'm not losing money either. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. And that same, and I've heard this from a couple of men. No woman has ever told me that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I believe that we women should let our powers shine. Yeah. Whether it's to support somebody to be, you know, meditatively quiet and supportive in that way or crazy outgoing, like Lisa, you seem like, and I know that's how I am. <laughs> like I'm, I'm actually an ambivert. I can be extra extroverted, okay. but boy, I really, I cherish my downtime. <laughs> yeah. I cherish my downtime, but what energizes me is people. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you yeah. know, I still need that downtime to not have so much energy, Yeah. but um, okay. So I've got a couple of questions that I wrote down for you. I, me. Um, and these I'm being, I'm going to be very selfish here because these are questions I want to know. <laughs> Perfect. Those are the best ones. And I'm assuming that there are other people out there thinking about this. So, um, you know, part of that, uh, my husband and, and our sons and grandsons take care of me. Well, my husband and I literally switch, flipped the um, job duties in our life. And he does all the cooking, cleaning, taking care of the house. And I make the money. I love it. Um, that was the deal we made when we got married because I'm not domestic. Mm. Unfortunately, um, good and bad. My husband is a really good cook, but he only knows how to cook and only wants to cook really unhealthy food, mm. fried butter, everything. And during the pandemic, I feel really fortunate that my mind finally was able to relax enough to go, Oh my God, you're killing yourself. What you were saying about putting your health on the back so far, it's not even on the burner on the yeah. stove anymore. That's where I was. Yeah. And I'm really, I feel really fortunate that I finally, I feel like I woke up and went, why am I trying to kill myself with food and with working too much and all of those things you named? Yeah. So I'm purposely making a shift and I would say my biggest challenge is that cooking because I have never enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. It's always been stressful for me. I'm cooking my own healthy food now but it tastes horrible yes. probably cause I'm not putting love in it. <laughs> right. I'm vitamin L you got to put in the love. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> tell me how to turn my cooking into my spiritual practice because I, that's what I want. <laughs> right. Yes. Well, you know, spiritual practices are like everything else in our lives. They're really bio-individual. So what works for me might not work for you. That being said, there are ways to come to the kitchen in a different way. And I think really what I work on with, with clients is, you know, if you can start with whole foods and cook them from scratch, um, that's the first step. Exactly what I'm trying to do. And everything right now tastes like dirt. Yeah, no, that's not good. (laughs) We'll need to talk about that in depth. (laughs) I think I put too much. I heard that turmeric is good. So I like put it in everything. Put it in everything. Yeah. That's what. (laughs) I think, I think that's what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's that's what you're doing wrong. Yeah, um, I think we also, um, we've forgotten how to cook really. And very often what trips clients up is that they their approach to cooking dinner is, okay, I got to cook dinner. What am I going to cook tonight? 
and they go and they find a recipe and then they may or may not have to go to the grocery store. And then by that time, it's like such a production already. <laughs> so it, it really is. I, I think the biggest skill that I teach clients is in the kitchen, the, the best thing you can learn is that every time you cook, you should cook for more than one meal. And that doesn't mean I'm going to make a pot of chili and eat it all week because let's face it by day three, you're not feeling that love and that chili's going in the trash, right? So why, why bother, right? Why not right. make the chili and freeze half? Then someday when you don't have the energy or time or inclination, you have this meal in the freezer that you know you can use. The other things are, you know, you could spend some time prepping on the weekends You and, and it doesn't have to be a lot. Um, one of my favorite tricks for cooking is something called plan overs. It's like intentional leftovers. So if, you know, my, my favorite example is if I'm going to make, you know, a roasted chicken and some brown rice and some broccoli, what would happen if I made double of what I needed? Right. I could use that chicken in tacos and casseroles and soup and salad, all kinds of things. I could put the rice mm -hmm. in breakfast cereal, like a hot cereal. I could put it in a casserole the next day. Same thing for the broccoli. I could put it in a pasta salad. I could put it in uh, a soup. I could put it in a casserole. So if you get in this habit, then it's going to be very accessible. And you're not going to start every night. Like I got to start everything completely from scratch. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think the, the flavor thing really is a, a big stumbling block for a lot of people. And, you know, they'll say like, well, I love Mexican food, but I have no idea what to put in it. Well, surprise, Mexican food, spices and herbs are the same. So once you nail that combination, you're like, oh, I want to make a Mexican omelet. I want to make a Mexican soup or stew or whatever. You can just use that same combination of spices. But we go in and we kind of mess around and we end up with what I call bad 70s hippie food. <laughs> You know? <laughs> oh my God. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. You, may, I, 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 you just named my style of cooking. Bad seventies hippie food. Oh yeah. Okay. Remind me not to eat it. <laughs> oh my, my husband said, Oh, that chili. I made chili. Just like yeah. you said, I made a whole bunch of it. it smells really good. I had already eaten it. And I knew it tasted horrible. Oh, no. And I said, oh. yeah, I said, <laughs> you can have some, if you want some, he took a bite and went, Oh, what did you put in this? Uh, oh. Turmeric. <laughs> I did. I put turmeric in it. Yeah. Way too much, I'm sure. Probably too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We like to think <laughs> that if a little bit is good, then a lot is way better, right? <laughs> That's a very American attitude. Yeah. Like a little bit of a food is good. So if it's a superfood, I want a lot of it. You know? <laughs> but I think the, the the trick for that is really to, to learn some very basic cooking techniques and then be able to use them wherever you apply them. So when I, when I teach something like uh, making soup, for example, you know, we start off the class and everybody's like, I, I say, what's your favorite soup? Oh, there's chicken noodle and there's, you know, clam chowder and there's cream of broccoli and there's chili and all these different things. And, and I say, well, let's take a look at that. Are those soups the same or are they different? And everybody says, oh, they're really different but they're really right. not. So the basic technique is really you deconstruct that and you say every single soup recipe starts with sauteing or sweating some vegetables. And then you add some kind of liquid and then you add whatever else you want in the soup, cook it, and you can either eat it. So then you're, that's your chicken noodle, right? You could uh, puree it. That's your cream of broccoli, or you could thicken it with something, which is, you know, something like a, like a um, chowder, you know, you, you thicken it with a little bit of flour or something like that. But in principle, it's the same process, right? So when you start looking at it that way, you don't have to learn recipes by heart. You don't even have to start looking at recipes if you know those techniques. So I like to say, you know, dissect a casserole for me. What is a casserole? Well, there's usually some kind of starchy base. There's some kind of vegetable, maybe some meat or beans, something to glue it all together, right? Usually cheese, because that's yummy. And then there's something crunchy on top, right? So if you approach cooking that way, then it's like, oh, I don't even have to go to the grocery store because I have some brown rice left over. I have some cheese sauce. I have some broccoli and I have some cornflakes. Like there's your casserole, right? So oh, you make I it like sound to teach so it, much easier. Yeah, I like to I teach it that. as a technique. It's not it's not like one recipe, another recipe, another recipe. It's like let's look at what they right. have in common. Yeah, that's why because you know my, I, my company's I called Simply you. Health Coaching. And it's like let's simplify everything. Ah, simple, <laughs> simplify. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I feel calmer just hearing you talk about that because even though I'm not a, I'm becoming a cook. There you go. Notice my words. I am Notice one who words. cooks. Yes. I am one who, I am cooking. 
Yes. That is, you know, <laughs> that's another one of those my language cooking tricks. is improving. Exactly. Yeah. Every day my cooking is improving. Yeah. Yep. Especially with Lisa's help. So <laughs> um, do you have a website or anything like that? Um, Instagram, whatever, uh, where people can go and learn more from you about this? Absolutely. Cooking? Yeah. Um, so cooking was really the, the original thrust of my work was teaching people how to cook. And I still go there and, and you can still find all those resources on my website. Um, it's simplyhealthcoaching.com. And there are recipes, there are also uh, blog posts. And another thing that I wanted to say about food and cooking is that we're very used to thinking about, you know, food is food is food. And somehow we've fallen into this idea that you know, as Americans, we want the best car, the best data package, the newest phone, the best insurance policy, the nicest house we can afford, but our food should cost 99 cents. Yes. What I the heck? Think about it that way, but <laughs> you you're know? so right. What the heck? So if you start with the best ingredients and, you know, really think about the fact that the better the food you put in your body, the better your body's going to be. That doesn't mean that you have to eat everything organic. It just means that like spend your money wisely. <laughs> and uh, so what I really try to do with people is first get them eating whole foods that they cook from scratch. And, you know, if you're not cooking at all right now, or you're just eating processed food, it's not like I'm going to say, okay, next week, every single dinner must be made at home from scratch. No, no, no. It's like, make one meal. Just start with one. Let's do that for a few weeks. And then maybe try two. You know, and then I teach them how to relate those meals so that they're not starting completely from scratch every time. So that's sort of the principle behind all of my work, which is simplify it down and just make it really bite-sized. My favorite question to ask clients who come in with like, I'm going to run a 5k or I'm going to leave my husband or I'm going to find a new career. It's like, how would it look if it were easy? Right. How would it look mm, if it were I easy? Love that. Yeah. And that just means like, take it down a notch. Let's, if you want to run a 5k, great. What do you need to do today? Maybe you need to walk around mm. the block. Maybe you just need to get your butt off the couch. Right. Mm -hmm. And that that's easy. Running a 5K, not so easy. But if you think about that one little tiny step that you could do today mm -hmm. and then again tomorrow and then again tomorrow, mm -hmm. it feels yeah. it feels easier. It feels lighter, right? Yeah, I love yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, talking about your words, one thing that I've noticed, I noticed it first in myself and now in others that I train and coach, is when they use that word hard, they <laughs> really believe you know, we've all been raised saying yeah. you got to work hard. Yes. Right? Yeah. That hustle and grind. Living, you have to work hard. Well, what if yeah. we didn't have to yeah. work hard? What if it, what I love that. What if it was easy? Yeah. What if what it if were it easy? Fun? And yeah. And that, that whole, it, it's hard. Um, I have a lot of people who start out with that attitude. It's hard to get healthy. Okay. Well, let's talk about what it would look like if it were easy. Right. And, and I always tell that people, you me. know, it's you hard. have a choice at every moment of your life, like binge Netflix or workout, chocolate cake, <laughs> Apple, Instagram, go to bed. Like every single one of those is a choice. Mm -hmm. The easy choices, half the time, make the better choice. Just half the time, right? Don't yeah. worry about being perfect because we're so into this, like all or nothing. Like I go all week without eating dessert. And then on the weekends I binge. Well, wouldn't it be better to just have dessert a couple of times during the week than have yeah. five desserts in one day? <laughs> right. And feel horrible. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then we go into this yeah. spiral of really judging ourselves, which is deadly, oh, yeah. right? We're just like, oh, like I said, two ways to ask the question. Oh, why did I do that again? <laughs> Instead yes. of, oh, that's really weird. Why did I do that again? And then it's mm -hmm. the beginning of a conversation and it's like, oh, I had a burger instead of a salad because it's winter out and I don't want to eat anything cold. Or I went to a restaurant where a salad wasn't an option. Or I'm eating with friends who exert this pressure on me not to be good. Fine. At least you know the reason. And then next time you can set yourself up for success. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things that works really well for me is... Um, you know, cause I love to binge on Netflix, but instead of binging on Netflix first, Raising my hand say, here. <laughs> <laughs> after I do 30 minutes yes. on my Peloton bike, or after I do 30 minutes on my treadmill or whatever I've decided to do, yeah. then I get to watch an episode of fill in the blank. <laughs> I love that. And there's actually a name for that process in, in oh. integrative nutrition, and it's called crowding out. 
And so when you think of those examples I gave you, like if you have a choice between a chocolate cake and an apple and you really want the chocolate cake, you know the apple's better for you, have the apple first and then have maybe Mm. a smaller piece of cake, right? Now, Ah. some people say, well, then you're getting way too many calories anyway. It's like, yes. And at the same time, you gave your body something that was good for it before you gave it something that you wanted emotionally, right? Same thing, like like exactly what you said. I actually have clients who have said, I will only watch as much television as I spend working out. So it's like, you want to watch an hour long show, you better move your body for an hour. Right. right. And so what happens is you, you crowd out the not so good choices because over time you might suddenly realize like, wow, I don't even want the chocolate cake. And I chose the apple seven times this week out of 10. Right. It's just, Mm -hmm. it's easier. What would this look like if it would be easy? It would be having both of them. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and what I've been doing, cause I was one who, um, I want something sweet to end every meal, want something sweet to end every meal. Yeah. So I got some sugar-free gum, real the cinnamon. I mean, it's really powerful Yeah. and, um, and I love the taste of it. And so now, as soon as I, my brain goes, I need something sweet. I just finished eating. I need something sweet. I go, okay, I got it. Yeah. Two piece gum. Right. I don't want, I don't want anything else after that. Cause that super tangy, sweet. Yep. Now I know that they say now you're still training your taste buds to want sweet. to want sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm hoping to be able to stop that, but I'm figuring I'm on the right path. You are. At least I'm not eating that chocolate cake. Exactly. Or that kind of ice cream. And it's baby steps, right? So eventually you might How would make it be the decision. Easy? How, what this would it look like if easy. it were easy? <laughs> yes, exactly. Pop a piece of gum in your mouth. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's baby steps. Instead of trying to be perfect right off the bat, just try to make the right choice half the time and then 75% of the time and then 80% of the time and then stop there. You know, one or two times out of 10, eat the cake and enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. You And see, that's the thing too, Lisa. And I know you've heard this before, um, but when we have the cake and we feel guilty as we're eating it and i don't know about other people but when i'm feeling guilty about eating and i ate it really fast yeah and then you want more (laughs) exactly where did that go yeah is it already gone yeah um yeah so i'm not enjoying it anyway right and then i feel guilty yeah. yeah. So I'm and there's hard some, on myself. yeah, being hard on yourself. And there's also evidence that when you, when you eat really quickly or when you eat and you don't pay attention, like as Americans, we love to eat al desco, like forget al fresco. We're eating at the desk oh, because that. we're working I through, right. We're just going to work through lunch. There's actually yeah. evidence that your body doesn't register it as, Oh, I've eaten, which is why by 2 PM sure? you're like, I need a snack because your body, yeah like your brain doesn't register that you ate because you filled your stomach, but you didn't savor it. You didn't actually taste it going down. You didn't think about where that food came from. So that's another thing that I really like to bring into the eating equation, which is, you know, whole foods cooked from scratch, eaten mindfully, like sit down and enjoy that meal. Even if it's stuff that, you know, is not that great for you, enjoy it. Right. And then really think about portion control. You know, there, there are yeah. lots of ways you don't have to weigh and measure. There are ways to eyeball your portions, but those are really sort of the principles behind, behind the eating part of the equation. And then we move on and we, we look at what else, like, like I said, you know, is it your job that's making you eat? Is it your husband that's making you eat? Are your kids driving you crazy? <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What else in your mm-hmm. life is not, not nourishing you and making you turn to food because food is an easy, it's an easy, easy out for when we want to stuff down our emotions. Right. <laughs> Yeah. And I will tell you that that is the realization. And it kind of was, you know, nagging in my brain for a very Mm -hmm. long time But with COVID not being able to go run, you know, and numb myself out that way by, you know, now I have to go to this and now I have to go this and I have this fun thing to look forward to and that doesn't have any of that during COVID. So I actually had time to think and process stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, I am numbing myself out with food. Yes. Every yeah. day I am numbing myself out with food. Yeah. What am I trying to what keep from doing? feeling? What am I? Yes. Yeah. And that's really it. Like if you're using it to numb out or you're using it like as a form of control because, you know, everything else in your life feels out of control, but you can control your food. You know, that's where a lot of the eating disorders come from. It's like, I can control how many calories I take in because everything in my life feels crazy. You know? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And I think yeah. you've really made a very good point that the pandemic for a lot of people has been about that. It was like somebody just put this huge finger on the universal pause button 
<laughs> it's kind of like, okay, we're all going to stop. We're all going to take a look at all the things that haven't been working because now we can't ignore them. Like issues with healthcare, labor, education, childcare. Like you look at these things like, yeah, we've known for a very long time that there are problems with these, but we've been able to kind of push it aside. Well, now we're going to look at it. And not just that, we're going to feel it. Like we are going to sit, <laughs> you're like you're stuck in the muck and you're going to feel it. The emotions this year have been absolutely off the charts, you know? <laughs> and, you know, is there a way to, to use that pause in a, in a very intentional way rather than using it as, well, we're just all going to hold our breath and then everything will go back to normal. It's like, Mm, let's realize that normal didn't work for a lot of people. Normal has not worked for a lot of people, whether we're talking women or people of color, it has not worked. And so let's not go back to that. Let's not yearn for that normal that wasn't good for everybody. And just thinking about like, how can we, how can we go forward in a way that, that makes more sense for everybody? Yeah, that I, I do, you know, while COVID has been horrible and we've lost so many people and, yeah. you know, many reasons that it's horrible, I always do like to look at the silver lining. And I really agree with yeah. you, Lisa, that that is a big silver lining. Yeah. That if we have actually learned these lessons, um, even partially, yeah. we're going to benefit from it. Yeah. And it, it really brings me right back to my work in nonprofits where I was a grant writer. And one of my, one of my bosses was just, he was just incredible at the way he could, he could pull in grants, you know, but he, he said, you know, don't ever talk about something as a problem. It's not a problem. It's an opportunity. Because again, just like asking the question two different ways, if it's a problem, that's the end of the line. Like if you have a problem, there is one solution for it. And if you can't find that solution, you're in trouble, right? But if you look at it as an opportunity, it's like, oh, we could try this or we could try that. Oh, or look over here, we could try that, right? And then it's the beginning of a conversation. So you never write a grant yes. proposal talking about here's the problem. You say, here's the opportunity. Let's, let's work on this. That. Yeah. 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 It's really another one of those mind games, like language, shifting our oh. thoughts, shifting our reality. Yes. I, I could talk to you all day long about that. I know. So I know <laughs> I have another big topic. Okay. I have another big topic that I want to shift to. All Thank right. you for talking about the cooking because yeah. guess what? It, here's the other thing. My husband told me, this is before COVID. <laughs> I wasn't cooking at all. Just eating the stuff he cooked. Yeah. Cause it tastes delicious. Gained tons of weight, blood pressure problems, everything else reversing all of that now. Yeah. Thank goodness for doing that. But I was watching, like you talked about entertaining, which is mm -hmm. okay. Right. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. But you need to not stop there. My husband said, you watch more cooking shows than anyone I know who doesn't cook at all. <laughs> have you read Guess anything? What? Ha have now you read anything by Michael cooking? Pollan? Oh, I've everything. Yes, I have yes. all of his books. So, you know, <laughs> that he says, you know, we are a nation obsessed with cooking shows. Absolutely yes. obsessed with it. I have clients mm -hmm. who tell me, oh, I don't have time to cook. And yet they have time to watch an hour long episode of Iron Chef. And I'm like, wait a minute. Like nobody mm -hmm. is going to come through this door, give you half a pig and tell you that make the seven course meal and every course has to have a piece of the pig in it. Right. <laughs> That's not reality. Come on. <laughs> and the other thing is you don't have like 20 minions doing the dishes while you cook. Right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's yes. right. That's right. But yeah, we are obsessed with cooking shows and we don't cook ourselves. Yeah. Mm -mm. yeah. Um, but now that I am starting to cook, at least I know the lingo. I'm yeah. like, Hey, congratulations on watching all those years of cooking shows. <laughs> it's kind of like the not great that British... I need to know the lingo. Right. Yeah. Like, like the great, great British, British baking, baking show is my favorite. <laughs> that is my absolute favorite. It's yeah. like meditation for me. It so is. When you said cooking is your spiritual practice. I could really feel that because that great British baking show, that is my meditation. Yes, I know. It's really, it's amazing. And I, what I love about it is, you know, we all have to eat, right? We, that's just a fact of life. We have to eat. And so why not treat food either as entertainment or as religion, or I mean, not in a bad way, but, or as no. play or as meditation, yeah. like how could you look at your food in a way that doesn't feel, oh my God, I have to cook three meals a day. This is making me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Yeah. 
I'm really lucky I don't have to do that. My husband fixes his own food. He still wants to eat that way. I'm fixing my own food. Yeah. And eventually, oh, I, and I'm going to pat myself on the back because I did something right that I didn't even know I was doing right. You said one thing at a time. I've figured out breakfast. Yes. Perfect. Start with one breakfast. Down. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yep. It's the baby steps. And I don't know how much you've read about, about habits and forming habits. There are a couple of really great books about that. Um, James Clear. Share that please. Yeah. James oh, yeah, Clear James wrote Clear. a great book called Atomic Habits. And the idea behind mm -hmm. it is that the habits are so small that they are like atoms, but their outsized impact is like an atomic bomb. So when you think about mm -hmm. atomic, it could mean two very different things, but what he's saying is yeah. start with the little tiny thing then add one more, then add one more. It's like, it's called habit layering. And then at the end, you have this incredible impact. And there's another author named uh, Charles Duhigg who wrote um, The Power of Habit. And that mm. is a great book because he, he picks apart a habit and talks about each step, like what's going on? If you, if you remember back to like corporate days, like very predictably at three o'clock in the afternoon, there are certain people in the room who are like, I gotta have a snack, right? What's the trigger? It's three o'clock. <laughs> That's the only thing, That's right. right? It's like three o'clock. I'm almost ready to go home. I got to do something, right? And he mm -hmm. says, what if you were to feel that trigger and do something that's a better choice. What if you feel that trigger mm -hmm. and you go walk up and down the stairs a couple of times? What if you go talk mm -hmm. to a, to a, to a coworker over in their cubicle or their mm -hmm. office and then come back and see, like, do you really need that snack? <laughs> so there's this mm -hmm. idea that first of all, there's the idea of, of layering these tiny habits up over time. So yeah, start with breakfast and then maybe one of your snacks and then maybe a lunch, right? The other idea mm -hmm. is that we all come to health through a different I call it a gateway, <laughs> your gateway drug. What's your gateway drug for health, <laughs> right? Not what's oh, your I gateway to that. all the, yes. <laughs> yeah. But you yeah. know, for some people it's physical activity. Like they start working out and all of a mm -hmm. sudden they're like, wow, I feel great. I'm going to start eating better. And they start mm -hmm. sleeping better and they're just nicer to be around. Right. So Duhigg calls this uh, a keystone habit. So for you, it might be cooking for somebody else. It might be physical activity for, for a third person. It might be sleep but you just make a change in that one area and you'd be surprised at how many other things just kind of fall into place because you've made mm -hmm. one small change. And all of a sudden your body is like, Oh, I can make better choices and I could make a better choice in this area of my life too. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Switching topics to how do you stop taking care of everyone else and care for yourself? <laughs> yes. I have had this conversation with women for so long. And no matter what ideas I've come up with, they say, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but <laughs> yeah, but I don't have time. <laughs> yeah, but right. Yeah, but what yeah. will they do without me? Yes. Yeah, but I love my husband. I love my son. I love my right. family. Yeah. They need me. Mm -hmm. But you know what? That's the whole point is they need you. And if you stop taking care of yourself, you're not going to be around. They're, they're not going to have you and they're going to need you even more. <laughs> but really what I, what I tell women who, who like, we, you know, we were talking about like self-care is not even on their radar, right? Because they think it involves a million different things. They think it is mani-pedi, yoga, meditation, workout, this, that, the other thing, you know, <laughs> it's like this long list and it becomes another list of to-dos. And the last yes. thing we women need on our plate is to-dos. <laughs> so here's what I tell these women. I say, I don't want you to think about um, any of the, sorry, my, my phone is dinging. Can you hear it? No. Mm -mm. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. All right. So what I tell these women is that I don't want you to think about self-care as a long list of to-dos. Self-care is what we think we should be doing because somebody else has told us, right? You should be eating this way. You should be working out this way. You should meditate every day. You should, you should, you should. I'm like, stop shooting all over yourself, okay? That is everybody else's opinion of what you, sh you should be doing, right? Yes. And what I tell them is, you know, self-care is what Cosmo tells us we should be doing. And soul care, <laughs> soul care is what the cosmos is asking you to do, Ooh, right? So that's I my big nugget. Self-care that's what everybody else, especially those magazines is telling you self-care is soul mm -hmm. care. You drop into your body and you think, Oh, what does my body want? 
sometimes your body wants to sleep in an extra 30 minutes, right? Sometimes it's not getting up to work out. Sometimes it's letting yourself rest another 30 minutes. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's, I just want to sit with my cup of coffee and a good book. Fine. Right. So, you know, if you're a morning person, what I would ask somebody to do is how about if you block off 10 minutes, 15 minutes, just 10 or 15 minutes and keep that sacred. That is your appointment with yourself. And that is your container. And that container can have a million different options in it. It could be stretching. It could be meditation. It could be journaling. It could be just reading a book, whatever it is. When you get to those 15 minutes, drop into your body and think, what am I, what is my body asking me to do? And that's where it starts. It really starts with engaging that inner wisdom that we've stopped listening to because we we love to get our advice from everybody, right? Mm -hmm. We love mm -hmm. to get advice from Dr. Google and from, you know, self magazine <laughs> and the doctor and my best friend and, you know, my cousin and my mother and my husband and my kids, they all have an opinion of what I should be doing with my time. But wait a minute, like, what do I want to be doing with those 15 minutes, right? And if you can mm -hmm. just carve out, I actually had somebody say carve in the time. And I'm like, yes, carve it in. <laughs> Don't carve it out. Yeah. <laughs> right? I like that. I like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. And just if 10 minutes, literally 10 minutes can make a difference. And if you start with 10 minutes, you're going to start feeling better. And you know, there's all these really old <laughs> sayings that like, oh, put on your own oxygen mask first. And yes, we get that on an intellectual level. But the image I really prefer is you can't pour from an empty cup, right? And as women, especially women in mission-driven work, we tend to pour it all out. We, we will drain our cup dry, tip it over, shake out the little things in the bottom, right? The dregs. Absolutely. Do you want to keep giving people dregs? No, Ooh. you want to fill that cup so that what you're giving other people is what's overflowing, right? So it's shifting from this, this perspective of, lack. Like there's not enough for other people. How can I feed myself? It's abundance. Like I have so much because I feed myself that I can give the leftovers, like what's overflowing I can give to somebody else. And it's, again, it's just a mindset shift that you're going to fill your cup. So people are getting your overflow. They're getting your abundance rather than getting the dregs. They're not getting what's left over. Right. I love that. I love yeah, that. It's just another little mind um, shift. It, <laughs> it is. And uh, I think awareness, it, it is really helping me. I think I, I have been in denial for so long. Do you see that in other women? They're in oh, yeah. denial yeah. that, yeah, I know that I could burn out, but yeah. I still have to get this done. Yeah. Do you and really my know? Husband, yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> and I want to speak to your your Who's women. Making like, you do this? <laughs> the women that you right, the women that you coach and mentor. When you think about that whole idea, like you are working for yourself. I run my own business. There is always something I can be doing. Always, always, always. So is that to do list ever going to get to done? No, it's not. Nope. So why not just say, you know what, this is the one thing I have to get done today. And I know I'm going to get more done than that. But if I get this one thing done, I can call myself done for the day because you know, you're going to keep yeah. working, right? You're going to keep working. But if you can shift to that idea of, I'm just going to have three things on my to-do list today, three really small things, and I'm going to get them done. And after that, I can choose to be done because you know, you're not going to, you will still work the full day. And everything else is gravy. And then you can shift out of this, like I had 75 things to do and I only did 25 to, hey, I had three things to do and I did 25, <laughs> right? Yeah. Different energy, different feeling yes. like, oh, that was easy. Again, how would it look if it were easy? It would look easy if I only had three things to do in a day. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And that really gives you permission to say, yes, that to-do list is never going to be done. And since that's true, then I need to take care of myself. Right. And then you, that. then you start drawing those boundaries and saying, I don't work after five o'clock. I don't work on weekends. Even as an entrepreneur, you can do that. You can say, this is my boundary and I don't cross it. And that's so mm -hmm. much healthier because then you really do get into that place where you are nourishing yourself with time in nature, time with friends, exercising, cooking for yourself and making those 
those are the self-care things. You know, we, we have this idea that self-care is exotic and expensive and takes time and money and we have to make appointments for it. it's like, no, choosing to feed yourself better food, that is self-care. Choosing to move your body, that is self-care. And it's really, again, just dropping in and getting out of your head and all the shoulds and thinking, what is my body asking me for? Mm. Yeah, I love that thinking about what is my body asking me for, because I was trying to think about how do you actually become aware? And I think that's a really good way to do it. Yeah. Not what is my brain saying? Right. And the funny thing is when you start monitoring yourself, see how many times in a day you say, I think, well, I think that blah, blah, blah. I think, I think, I think, I think you are living in your head, right? What if you were to say, I feel I feel like Mm. this. I believe this. That's a heart-centered, body-centered way of approaching the world. This is how it makes me feel. It's not, this is what it makes me think. Mm. Just that one shift. Yeah. You've given so many great tips, Lisa. I'm so excited for (laughs) everybody to listen to this podcast. (laughs) All the things. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Yeah. And unfortunately we are at the end of our time. So Lisa, people who are listening to this going, I need more Lisa. (laughs) (laughs) Go through Julie Trombley. No, I'm kidding. Uh, we've, I don't think we talked about this on the recording. I just have to say that I am the deeply forever grateful recipient of the services of one of the people that you trained. And I like every day I give thanks for Julie. (laughs) Julie is amazing. And yes. Um, has she saved you time? Oh yes. Yeah. And see, that was a self-care thing. I was running my own business and I, you know, I love cannabis and I like social media and I like to like mess around with technology, but is that getting me new clients? No, that's like not the best place to use my time. Right. So when I found Julie, I was just like, okay, I'm a total control freak, but I think I can let go of this. <laughs> and it was so fun to find her because we're like soul sisters. We have the same sense of humor and we're snarky and we're, it's just like, it was so easy for her to pick up my voice and, you know, start posting stuff for me, <laughs> but it really did. And, and that was a self-care thing. Like I, I was not going to be able to do all this and find new clients and deliver my programs. So yeah. it was just a perfect fit and it came at a perfect time. So Thanks so much. Gratitude to you. (laughs) Yeah. Gratitude to Julie. I actually interviewed Julie on a podcast recently, so that'll be going out live soon. So if anybody wants to hear Julie's podcast interview, um, you know, you can go to Dare to Leap and see Julie on there. And now one of her clients, Lisa. That's right. Um, Giving testimonials. I just... (laughs) Yeah. I just noticed your last name is Baker. I know. How could I not do something with food, right? (laughs) Why do you think I didn't change my name when I got married? (laughs) I'm a little slow on the uptake. So So Lisa, um, we will put a link to anything you want us to link to in the show notes, your website, anything else you want us to make sure we put in there, any other way you want people to be able to get in touch with you. You know, my website, simplyhealthcoaching.com is, is Lisa central. You can find everything there. And on the front page, there's links to everything that you need to know about me and my programs and how you can find me, how you can work with me, where you can hear my podcast. It's, it's all there. It's all on the homepage. Awesome. What's the name of your podcast? Uh, it's the Simply Health Coaching Podcast. <laughs> I love it. Love it. The yep. Simply Health Coaching Podcast. I love it. Yep. I love it. Okay. Well, guess what? I'm going to be going and downloading. Yeah. Simply exactly. Health Coaching Podcast. Yep. Season I one. Love you know, podcasts. Yeah. I'm a <laughs> podcast fanatic. It's ridiculous Me how many too. I follow. <laughs> but yeah, season one was all about food and what's the best way to eat. And, you know, if you need to figure out if something in your food is not being good to you, how do you figure that out? And so that was all of season one. And now in season two, I've completely switched over to an interview format and I'm interviewing women who are burning out and the practitioners who help these women and also people who are funding and looking for innovative ways to fund the health of these women. Oh, I love that. I love that. Well, I will be definitely listening to all the above. Thank you. <laughs> Lisa, thank you so much for being here today. I greatly thank appreciate you for it. Having me. It was so much fun. God, we could talk for hours. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't this time fly? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Bye, thank everybody. You. 
Thank you for listening to Dare to Leap. Say hello and access additional resources at virtualexperttraining.com. There, you'll be able to connect with Kathy to share her feedback and join her community. Join us again soon on Dare to Leap. Until then. Mm-hmm.